Hello and welcome back to the channel. I was hoping to be with you a couple of weeks ago, but things got in the way, such as the panto, and I've not been very well. So first of all, a huge thank you to everyone who commented on my video regarding running Windows 10 on this bad boy. Thanks for all your suggestions for the different operating systems. We narrowed it down and released a poll between Linux Mint and Windows 10 Tiny. There are lots of other options, but those seemed good places to start. If my lighting or contrast or anything seems a little bit off, it's because this is the first time I'm using my new camera, so I'm yet to get to grips with everything. So just Bear with me. Today, as per the majority vote in the poll, we're going to be installing Linux Mint on here to see if it runs better than Windows 10 and whether we can breathe some new life into this old hardware. While Linux Mint is still in active development, the 32-bit version ceased development back in 2019. So we have to bear in mind that there won't be any updates or security patches from this point on. In addition, a lot of software developers have stopped developing for 32-bit hardware, and that's just a sign of the times. Nobody's doing 8 or 16-bit programming anymore, and in the same way, developers are not running with 32-bit, which has been discontinued by most of the major manufacturers. So Linux Mint comes in three flavors. So there's Cinnamon, which is the most advanced version of Mint in many ways. It contains a lot more features, but more features means more requirements, so we'll obviously slow things down. There's Linux Mate, which is a much more stable version of Linux Mint, and it's got lots of features still. And finally, there's Linux XFCE, which is the most cut down version. And it's this that we're going to be trying on the P11Z. And that's to give it the best chance of running well on this first generation 32-bit Atom with 2 gig of RAM. For those of you who are not familiar with Linux, me included prior to making this video, it's worth noting that Linux Mint has a very simple user interface that'll seem quite familiar to anyone who's used Windows. So come Converting across shouldn't prove too much of a challenge. So in order to do an install, you're going to need three things. You're going to want a Linux ISO, you're going to want Rufus 3.5, and you're going to want a blank USB stick. I put links to the ISO and to Rufus below so they're easy to find. I'm afraid you'll need your own USB stick. Creating the bootable USB couldn't be easier. Simply put your USB stick into the computer, then launch Rufus 3.5. Once you're in, make sure you select the correct USB stick, as everything is about to be erased. Under the boot selection, hit select and find your ISO file. You can rename the USB stick to anything you want, otherwise when you're ready, just hit start. You'll be greeted by this pop-up, and this is because Rufus needs a couple of extra files in order to create the bootable disk for Linux. Just hit OK. Once that's done, it'll offer you two output options. It should already have selected ISO. If it hasn't, make sure you select it, and then just hit OK. You'll be met by the warning that all the data will be deleted. This is the last chance to make sure you've got the right drive. Hit OK, and now just sit back and wait. It'll take about 15 or 20 minutes, depending on the speed of your USB drive. Now that's done, all we need to do is pop the USB in and boot it up. The first boot takes a while, and this is because it's actually booting the operating system from the USB stick itself. It gives you this trial mode, and this is very handy because it allows you to check that it is going to work on your system before you do an install. Once you've had a play around and decided that Linux Mint is for you, it's time to click the install button and follow the instructions. It took about 15 minutes to install on my system, which does have an SSD, so it'll be a little bit longer if you've got a traditional mechanical drive.
So let's boot this up. And since it's the first time we're booting it, let's see how long it actually takes. So that's pretty fast, 48 seconds. Let's pop in my password, 007 as always. And there we go, everything's loaded. So under a minute and a half, it's pretty quick. So on your first boot, you're gonna be met by this welcome screen. I'm just gonna try and make it a little bit clearer for you. So on first boot, you're met by this welcome screen and I would strongly recommend going through the first steps guide. So in here, you can take system snapshots and I suggest you absolutely do that as the first thing that you do. Should anything happen after that untoward to the system and I did manage to crash it, then you can simply insert your Linux USB, launch time shift and it'll restore everything to how it was. Next up, you've got your drive manager. Again, I would launch that. It'll go online and find the latest drivers if you're missing any. And then we've got the update manager. Manager. And it was this that managed to crash my system. I believe it was trying to install some 64-bit software. After that, you can head into system settings to make things as you wish. And then, of course, there is the software manager. So in here, we've got all the things you might expect, maps and Dropbox, Steam for playing games, although I doubt we'd get very far on this. There's a lot of software actually available for Linux. Heading back to the welcome screen, we've then got documentation. There's a help feature. And if you are into software development, then you can contribute. So you'll have gathered from these files, this isn't actually my first boot and we'll come back to those in a few minutes. So if we open the uh, task manager, let it just settle down and you'll see that we're only using 13% of our two gig of RAM and there's no swap file at all. So this is an incredibly efficient operating system. In addition, the CPU is idling at under 10%, which again is pretty good when we compare it to Windows 10. So let's take a look around. First of all, you might think you need to install Office, but you don't. It comes automatically installed. So here's LibreOffice. It's got dictionaries, a database, LibreOffice launcher, a calculator, a drawing program, a presentation program, a mathematical formula program. I'm, I've had a play. I'm not really sure what to do with that. And then obviously LibreOffice Writer, which is like Word. All these programs are compatible with Microsoft Office. And as you can see, we've got all the usual functions up at the top. There's a spell checker, you can highlight things. This is basically Word just done by another company. When you come to save it, if you hit save as, you can then choose the format you want. And as you can see, it includes Microsoft Office 97, 2003, 2007. So we'll just choose that one and we'll save it. All of the Office applications run really well on this system. They're fast and responsive. And of course, one of the great things about this particular device is that you can have two items open on the same page and actually get a decent viewable area. It's a little tricky with this mouse to actually achieve that and unfortunately under Linux I can't find a hotkey to jump into a half of the screen. Perhaps if you know you could pop a comment below. So let's take a look at multimedia playback. So if we go under multimedia, you will see I've installed VLC and Audacity from the store, but Linux came with a media player, Pulse Audio Volume Control and Rhythmbox all pre-installed. Rhythmbox is pretty good. Like a lot of media players, it will create a library. One of the issues I had is that playback isn't always very smooth until it catches up. So you might notice this doesn't sound quite right. And no, it's not just the very tinny speakers on the P11Z. Most of the media players appear to play things back faster than they should. I had a look at this and it seems to be because they're encoded higher than 128. What is interesting is that Audacity has literally no issue playing back this one at 320 kilobytes. So let me just load it up, select a point, and that's much more like it should sound. So if I stop that and export it as an MP3, and that should export it into my document. And there it is. So if we play it back again, and yes, it still sounds bad because of the tinny speakers, but it now plays back at the correct speed. So we've sorted out 
playing back mp3s. When it comes to video things are not quite as easy as that and I think a lot of it's down to the pesky GMA 500 that's installed. After a bit of hunting around on the internet it appears that the Linux kernel does indeed support the GMA 500. However the GMA 500 has never truly been supported by anyone and so it's a bit rubbish. So I've tried a few different formats. So this is a WMA file. I'm going to use VLC. So as you can see the image and the sound aren't quite matching. And when you look you can see we're dropping quite a few frames. It's just about watchable. Here's a 340p mp4 and this is the normal built-in media player. And yes it's going to be a bit dodgy because it's only in 340p so it plays back but you can see it's glitching constantly, it's not very happy and if we launch the task manager you can see that even on this 340 playback it is still using the CPU and it is maxing that CPU out which is why we're getting so many artifacts. I did think an AVI might be easier as generally I've found CPUs deal better with AVIs but again we've got the same issue and as you can see we're dropping absolutely tons of frames in a 720p AVI. So let's try 340p. So this is just about playable. I don't think we're dropping too many frames. You can see the CPU is not quite maxed out, but it's hardly a multimedia experience. A lot of the things we do on our computers these days are actually done online. In Linux, it comes pre-installed with Firefox, which is actually quite an efficient browser. For light tasks such as looking up news or going on Wikipedia, this is perfectly functional. But what about multimedia heavy tasks? So here's an example of YouTube loading in Firefox versus YouTube loading in Edge on Windows 10. As you can see under Linux, we're running quite a bit quicker. Now let's find a video and see what playback is like. So as you can see with standard settings, it's a bit glitchy. It's not really watchable. Um, so I'm just going to pause that. We're going to pop it in the lowest resolution we can choose. So, oh, let's not go lowest. We'll do 240p and we'll see what it looks like. So we've still got a lot of dropped frames. I really don't think this device is going to give us any decent YouTube playback. Let's pop a full screen on, see what it actually does. I think it might have a meltdown. So I've seen worse. So if you absolutely had to watch a YouTube video on here, you could, but I'm recommending you just use your phone instead. Linux Mint allows the P11Z and I'm sure other first generation Atom devices to come back to being a useful portable device. There are some limitations, but if what you're after is a bit of light internet browsing, word processing and other office tasks, and perhaps a little bit of MP3 playback, then this is going to work well for you. If what you wanted was to spend your time watching YouTube or playing movies back on it, then I'm afraid this isn't going to work for you. This is the first time I've actually used Linux, and I found the transition from Windows to Linux seamless and very easy. It's got many familiar things such as a start button and a taskbar and many of the system adjustments are listed under the same names. There's a lot of software available for Linux and the fact that it's got LibreOffice built in means this is very easy to pick up and just use. While this version is no longer being maintained and so we need to be careful of security online for example and viruses etc etc it's worth noting that there are generally less threats for Linux than there are for operating systems such as Windows XP or Windows 7. That doesn't mean that you should go using this for anything with sensitive data though. For those of you who need to use Windows specific applications so Linux just won't work for you, I am going to install Tiny10 on here. Tiny10 is a really stripped back version of Windows 10. Again, there are security issues because there's no built in defender, but in theory, it should run pretty well on this system. So we're going to have a look at that in a future video. I am hopeful that under Tiny10 we might actually get some video playback on here, perhaps at 720p, because I did manage to do that on the early versions of Windows 10. When I've completed that I will of course put a link just here, otherwise I hope you've enjoyed this video, if you have a like and subscribe would be excellent. As always if you've got any comments, if you know something I don't about Linux that'll get that GMA500 cracking along then please pop a comment below so I can give it a whirl before I install Tiny10. My name's Hugh, this has been Handheld Computing, thanks for watching.